we're going to launch right into the next section here, which is a, a section of three excellent talks on different use cases for artificial intelligence that focus on people who are building technologies oriented towards the public good. That might mean because they are solving particular challenges that exist in the public sector. It might mean that they are taking different design approaches to challenge uh, some of the conventions that we have about what some of the problems are in AI as it's currently designed and how that affects the public good. But what unites all three of these talks is that orientation towards making sure that artificial intelligence is being built as a technology that is oriented towards that public good and towards making sure that it is a technology that is beneficial for all of us. So uh, we're going to have three different speakers here, uh, or four different speakers on, on three different technology topics. Um, I'm going to introduce what those topics are very briefly, and then uh, the speakers are going to come out and join us one at a time, and I'll introduce each one of them to do a talk. After each one of them does their talk, um, we're going to invite the four of them to come up here and have a group discussion amongst the four of them uh, in order to pull on the threads that exist between these different use cases for artificial intelligence and pull on the threads um, between how their work intersects with each other. So uh, going very briefly through what we have here is, is first we're going to have um, Danny Deal from Band Lab uh, talking about their, um, their technology as it relates to music and creativity. We're going to have a presentation on Climate GPT from Rebecca Bross from the Open Climate Campaign at Creative Commons and Ariana Spring from Equity Labs. And then last, we're going to have Joshua Tan, who's the co-founder of MetaGov and who works on public artificial intelligence as part of the public AI network team. Uh, so if we could have the, you folks come on out here. Um, you can take your seats right there. And I'd like to invite Danny to come up first. So Danny Deal from BandLab serves as the head of communications and creator insights at BandLab, the world's fastest growing social music creation platform based in Singapore. She leads the company's strategic messaging and analysis of key industry trends. Before joining BandLab, she led music tech and music policy coverage at influential technology news outlet, The Verge. Additionally, Danny is a dance music producer and serves as a national trustee for the Recording Academy, which is the organization behind the Grammy Awards. So join me in uh, welcoming Danny. I've been to DC so much over the past couple of months. I was just here a few weeks ago for Grants on the Hill, um, <laughs> representing my chapter, the Chicago chapter of the Academy. But today I'm here for Band Lab. So I'm really happy to be in front of you to talk a little bit about Band Lab and what it is that we're doing to service creators, um, specifically with our AI tools. Now, as he mentioned, Band Lab is the world's fastest growing social music creation platform. We currently have over 100 million registered users, and that number is growing exponentially every single day. Uh, interestingly, we find that, oh sorry, could you go back? Thank you. So our, um, our software is available on both iOS and Android, which is a really important distinction because 80% of the world does not have access to iPhones. So we automatically have unlocked the ability to a wide swath of people that never had access or the ability to make music on their phones ever before. Um, but interestingly, even though it's available on both phones and browser, we find that 80% of our users are making music directly on their mobile devices. And most of them are under the age of 24. So they really are the next generation of superstars. Yeah. Now this is just a sampling of some of the uh, success stories that we've seen on BandLab. Uh, between David, well, Tyler, thanks so much, Curfew, Diego, Gonzalez, this is just a sampling of 10 or 11 artists. They have amassed about 9 billion streams uh, on their top five, top five spots. And they have about 109 million average monthly listeners on Spotify. And their average age is between 13 and 28. So they really are representative of uh, Gen Z creators, how they're interacting with technology, uh, digital first natives, and we're meeting them where they are, which is the studio that they have in their pocket. 
Some of you may be very familiar with these headlines. <laughs> AI and music is inescapable as a topic right now. Whether it's fake Drake with tone transfer, or whether it's artists like Grimes who deliberately made a tone transfer, uh, a replica of her own voice, for anyone to be able to collaborate with her. Artists are experimenting with AI in incredibly novel ways. And some of these are showing us the, uh, the loopholes and the places where we potentially need to look at regulation, um, such as David Guetta using Eminem's voice without his permission. And some of them are showing us the, the possibilities and the potential that exists with AI in order to assist artists. Uh, I don't know if anyone heard of what happened with the Beatles, but there was a new Beatles song that was able to be created uh, based upon <coughs> using AI for stem separation for, from old demos. So the possibilities truly are endless, which is both amazing and also a little bit frightening at this time. Uh, it's important to say, though, when it comes to band lab, in this arena, we've always been on the side of IP and on protecting rights holders. And so all of the work that we do in AI is grounded on commissioned data or in data where we have agreement with rights holders. So what does this all mean for music? The, long, the short answer is a lot, and the long answer is it's complicated. Um, it's important that we're proactive with AI and music because it's already mainstream. I think it feels novel to a lot of us because we are seeing these headlines and it's been proliferated and pushed in our face and been very intrusive in our day to day lives over the past year. But the reality is, AI and musicians have been coexisting for a very long time. There was a recent study by Ditto Music that estimated that about 60% of these artists are already using AI in their workflows daily. Um, a more recent study actually had a higher number, I think it was about 80% of artists uh, that are willing to or regularly use AI as a part of their process. At Vanda, we look at AI as a way to provide a leg up for artists, and we don't want it to be a leg stamping down on them. Our whole vision is about empowering users, and that is about a core mission of dismantling the barriers that exist for people with music. These are our three core AI principles. They speak for themselves. First is exalt the person at the algorithm. We want to give everybody the opportunity to make their voice heard, regardless of the background. And importantly, our tools are designed not to be vending machines. We don't believe in push button, get audio. We believe in building tools that are an inch wide and a mile deep that serve specific tasks. We also believe in traceability. Humans are involved in every step of the process. And all the proprietary models are built for BandLab, with BandLab, by BandLab. And then lastly, we believe in protecting creative choice. And that really just means that we believe people should opt in and not opt out. And if you want to be very liberal with your name, image, likeness, and catalog, that's totally fine. And also, conversely, if you want to be very protective, that is also OK. This just shows you an example of one of our tools. This is Song Starter. We're going to see a video in a minute. But uh, an example of uh, a couple of our tools, Song Starter gives you a little bit of a seed of a musical idea. A couple of uh, MIDI, a couple of bars of MIDI. MIDI is basically like sheet music. Uh, for It's a set of instructions for how to play music that then you can switch out the instruments to anything that you like. Uh, I always joke that we call it Song Starter and that song picture for a reason. And then Voice Cleaner is another one of our AI tools, and that provides people the ability to record very noisy situations, and the AI will clean up all of the background noise and give you a studio ready to And as you can see from our stats, it, they're pretty powerful, and they actually do enable people to feel like they can complete their creative visions and share them with the world. So what does this look like in practice? This is an example of Voice to MIDI. This allows you to say, oh, I don't need permission. No, it's the best access. It would be working fine before. I can just explain it. What you would have seen, <laughs> if you can envision on this play street, 
Uh, voice to MIDI is, is a tool that allows you. So a lot of people who are um, songwriters, they might know, they might think of a melody in their head, but they wouldn't know how to transcribe it. And so what this tool allows you to do is to sing that melody into the app, and then it will basically transcribe it, transcribe the melody for you. And then you can take that melody and you can assign it to any number of instruments that you want, you can a guitar, or make it anything that you like, which is pretty powerful for the average better musician. Hopefully the next video, This is yeah, a song cipher. Yeah. is a great way to use AI to generate new song ideas. This is what I started with. Once I loaded this project into BandLab, changed the BPM, added some new chords, recorded some vocals, and I've been trying to make it easy on you, baby. I had the shit that she told me. Did a quick arrangement, and this is the final product. I've been trying to make it easy on you, baby. I had the shit that she told me. Trying to make sure that she told me. shows what the power of AI can be when it operates as a collaborative yeah, tool. Yeah, that is a great... You could watch any other comments. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a great demonstration of how we actually look at implementing these tools. We want to provide niche-specific opportunities for creators to have the ability to finish the creative thought that they have in their head. We don't really find that there's a lot of value in putting in a few words and getting a three-minute song on the other end. We want to have the technology be able to assist in the creative process and to have creators be able to make music more efficiently uh, and for people that may not even know that they're creators to find that creativity within themselves. So on the last note, we do believe, oh, sorry, uh, we'll skip back that very quickly. We do believe, I see the one minute note, um, at BandLab we really believe that thoughtful regulatory policies will only enhance and enrich the culture of music. We believe that regulation fosters creativity and growth and that responsible and proactive measures are crucial to safeguard the music industry. And you'll see this with some of our partnerships on screen. We're very proud of our partnership with Universal Music Group, which is focused on protecting the artists' rights in the age of AI. And last year, Benla became the first music creation platform to align itself with Human Artistry Campaign, which is comprised of over 150 organizations that outlines principles for how we can responsibly use artificial intelligence to support human creativity and accomplishments and not replace them. We do believe that AI is a part of the future of music, but we also want the music industry to continue to be sustainable and to support our ability to thrive. In essence, BandLab isn't just a place where culture exists, it's a place where culture thrives. Creativity is innate in all of us as human beings, and our challenge and mission is to help turn those ideas into reality. AI is one of those ways in which we can make that happen. We see a future where AI will help everyone to a desired degree, where every artist has the freedom and the means to express themselves authentically through the use and collaboration with this technology. And these tools will help empower people who never had a chance around the world and create even more future superstars than we're already seeing. The list goes on and on, but we couldn't be more excited about the future, and we really appreciate everyone taking the time to learn a little bit about BandLab and what we're doing in artificial intelligence. Please come to our booth later today. We will have several demos set up, and we would love to have you interact with it yourself. Rebecca Ross and Ariana Spring um, talking about Climate GPT. So Rebecca is the Communications Manager for the Open Climate Campaign uh, at Creative Commons, a multi-year campaign that aims to increase equitable collaboration in finding faster solutions to the climate crisis through open access. For Creative Commons, Rebecca led the strategy and engagement portfolios at the National Academic Library Association, and we have Ariana Spring who is Head of Research at Equity Lab. 
Ariana is the head of research where she focuses on applications of responsible AI at the intersection of decentralized governance and cryptographic systems. Previously, she worked on the implementation of blockchain technology for the humanitarian use cases at UNICEF Innovation and Consensus Social Impact. Join me in welcoming them to talk about climate GPT. particularly in the context of solving the climate crisis. So at the uh, Open Climate Campaign, we have an ambitious goal to see all climate research and data available as open access. We're doing this because we believe that open access, which means research that is available without barriers, so not behind a paywall, and that has an open license like CC BY, is a necessary condition for solving the climate Global climate solutions must be built on open, transparent, and trusted research. This is also about climate justice, as those who are disproportionately affected by the climate crisis generally do not have access to this research or climate data. So currently, if you can just click the slides, next one. Perfect. Currently, only about 50% of all climate research is available as open access. So this means that only half of climate research has an open license. And an open license in this context is really important because researchers understand that by putting a license like CC BY onto their research, they are contributing to the public good. This is an act of consent and an act of sharing their preference. We believe that making this preference known is important, especially as the research ecosystem needs to be built on collaboration, attribution, and of course, trust. Next slide. So our campaign is made up of four program areas, advocacy, policy, coalition building, and our open workshop, all with the goal of making as much climate research available as open access. And just a quick plug, if you create, fund, or disseminate research and do not currently have an open access policy, come talk to me so we can resolve that. So our work is really about providing research and providing this research and data as open access so it can become a public good. It can be part of the commons, which then informs AI models. And then these AI models can mirror the way that scientific collaboration happens with attribution, reciprocity, and trust. So from our perspective of the Open Climate Campaign, the open license that's placed in this research really matters as a vehicle for researchers to be cited and give attribution. We see our role as working with researchers to help them understand the way their work is used in AI models for the public good. So the climate crisis is way too important to risk having researchers not open their research because of concerns about AI. So we really have to resolve this. So in closing, uh, we are very optimistic about the future of AI for the public good, and we believe that focusing our efforts on finding solutions to the climate crisis will help us both accelerate and improve AI practices. So just uh, in closing, we are just about to launch our paper pledge for the planet where we'll be going out and asking thousands of researchers to make their research available as open access. And as I do this, I would very much love to confidently be able to say that the AI models we'll be working with will help be part of the solution for all of us. Slide. 
Um, before we talk about solutions, it's always important to understand and level set around challenges. Um, so Danny, you know, called out a lot of the lawsuits going on um, in, the, in the world of AI today, but I also wanted to call out the issues that we see, such as uh, lack of transparency and issue of centralization and, and lack of representation. And what these look like in practice in the AI space right now is that we don't understand how models are trained. We don't understand what data went into them. We don't understand how much compute was used. We don't understand the climate impacts of the compute. Um, we don't understand the players that um, help to inform how the model was trained. Um, there was a, a CTO of a very large AI company that referenced in one of their product launches that she explicitly said she doesn't know how it was trained, how it was made. Um, and I think that's kind of shocking. We as users demand uh, better. Centralization is important because, um, as we heard in the earlier panel, there is a risk of um, single source or single point of failure collapse, right? It's a, a, when things are centralized, they're not resilient, they're not robust, um, and they're not representative. Um, as uh, I, I was reading a study that the Walton Foundation put out uh, this week, that said over 70% of K through 12 students, high school, or excuse me, K through 12 includes high school, uh, university students and teachers and parents uh, are currently using AI chatbots. So it's it's quite prominent. We can go to the next slide. Um, we can we can't really deny the economic impacts of AI. It's it's here. We can't you know debate whether or not we should use it or have it. Um, there is tremendous value that we see in, in using AI solutions. However, the problems call for new types of solutions. Um, go to the next slide. So our question is, who writes this next chapter? Um, is it going to be? And we can go to the next slide. Big tech, um, as we've seen in, in past. Issues such as Cambridge Analytica, I like to think of the co-opting of our personal data to be used against us and, and our sovereignty and our democracy is quite critical. Um, we've seen a lot of activity here on the Hill around um, keeping children safe online and understanding the impacts, the mental impacts and ultimately physical livelihood impacts of, of these technologies that are being driven ultimately by, by bottom line profits. And so we'd like to propose a new alternative. Um, go to the next slide. So um, we like to think that there is a future, a better future for AI using tooling that already exists. So we heard about all the great decentralized technologies that are currently at play. We see great um, use in open source, not only in terms of open source research, but open source technology and the community activating around that. You can look to things like cooperatives and seeing how people are collectively coming together and sharing resources, sharing information, creating more robust, resilient systems. Um, AI is unique because the inherent nature of AI, despite the challenges that it faces, is that you actually have to aggregate a lot of information from a lot of different places to make it smart. Um, it has to be representative, otherwise you get really faulty answers, which we see. Um, and it needs to be iterative because the models are constantly changing. As you're using the models, they're changing. And so these are all areas that can actually be enhanced by some of the tooling that we're, we're developing. So we believe cryptographic technologies, which are the things that underlie things like blockchain, um, are the way to make AI more transparent and more secure. Um, and so there's two primary ways that we like to think about applying cryptography. So the first is in what we call verifiable lineage. So this is understanding chain of custody information, which was also discussed earlier. This is like, how is your model trained? Who took place, or who took part in it? What took place? What machines were used? Um, and what the outputs were, what the benchmarks were, what the evaluations were. Understanding a full picture as much as possible. Right now, AI can be talked about as a black box. But really, there are things that we can see inside. It's just that people aren't sharing information. And so what we can do with things like cryptography and things like smart contracts is actually assign unique information and identifiers to each of the assets and, and participants and processes within a training of a life or an AI life cycle, excuse me. And then we can start to automate those processes because if for context, smart contracts basically are cryptographic tools that allow you to get business logic, automated business logic. And so when you start to think about automating how you train AI and programming in the policies and requirements and the governance, you begin to get these systems that can act without, um, hopefully, um, interference and bias. Um, verifiable governance. So decentralized systems require a multitude of participants, and we want to ensure that people that are participating are getting the attribution that Rebecca talked about and are being rewarded and incentivized for their contributions. And as you get people being rewarded and feeling as though they're part of the system, ideally they need to participate, and that strengthens the system as well. You mentioned that. 
Next slide. So, yeah, this is the, the optimistic view of what we see for, for equitable AI. Um, higher quality data comes by having more open source research, open source contributions, having a community that can actually validate the information, can validate the data. You can start to have people say, actually, I'm going to review this data. That's really like, low quality. You shouldn't include that in the training. You can begin to have like, communal decisions and, and governance. Um, when you open source uh, training of, of things, um, people can start to, to optimize faster. You can um, do red teaming, you can find bugs faster, and so it actually is more resilient to do it in a decentralized open, open source way. Um, easier to explain or review. You need transparency to understand why something did what it did, um, and that makes it safer, and that makes it more, again, resilient. Um, and then fair. Um, a lot of the conversation around AI um, and when it comes to creators and when it comes to, to user user data is that I didn't consent to that. Why is my, what I'm doing being a part of a system that I'm not being rewarded for? I'm not reaping the benefit from. And so what if we actually can create models in which you contribute data and you can see the attribution and then you actually get rewarded as your information is being used um, in, in, in um, So Next slide. Um, so this is just an example of one of the tools that we've built, um, which I'll also be at the demo later um, or the ex exhibition. Um, but we've actually built um, these, these transparent technologies to create a whole life cycle. We call it the AI Lineage Explorer. It's one of our, our solutions in our AI integrity suite. But essentially, you can go in and you can see um, who did what, when, and how. Um, and we have um, cryptographic identifiers, um, and you can go in and, and independently verify that. It's also portable and interoperable because we want this to exist outside of any single entity. So for the next slide, um, yeah. So we see um, self-sovereign AI as the future of AI development that we think is safer. Um, when it comes to things like regulation, I think the, the work around um, anti-monopolies is, is quite important, um, encouraging the use of decentralized technologies, understanding that some of these systems do require cryptographic technologies and not to confuse those um, uh, with um, you know, malicious intent is important. Um, so the next slide, I'll speak about climate GPT now. So um, climate GPT, is a collection of four large language models that are climate task specific that we trained um, last year. And so three of them were fine tuned on an open source model, um, Lama 2, and then one of them actually was a foundational model. And so we went through the entire process of what does it look like to train and fine tune an AI, but we did it using our transparency technology. So we can have a full lineage, which I'll show um, later in the demo, but we also, the governing entity for that. Um, process, we created what's called a DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization, which is essentially like a, an organization that is governed by smart contracts, as I mentioned. So you can have like programmable policies, everything can be um, visible, and you make decisions together. Um, and so we actually registered it um, using a regulation in uh, the UAE, which is through the Abu Dhabi Global Market. Um, they have what they call a distributed ledger technology regulation. Um, so that's a great example of what it looks like to actually regulate decentralized technologies in a way that encourages and fosters um, uh, innovation. And so um, to speak a little bit about the ECI, which is the Endowment for Climate Intelligence, which is like the governing body, it was important to us that as we're trying to create a model that is trying to solve the climate crisis, this needs to be a collaborative solution. So we worked with folks across enterprise, we worked with the amazing, brilliant AI engineers, um, members of civil society, academia, um, as well as climate experts to come together to figure out like what would it look like to train a climate model. And so it's a large language model. Um, it is, you can think of it really akin to a chat GPT, except what we did was we not only fine tuned it using high quality um, climate data, but we actually provide you with three different views in the interface. So instead of just saying, um, you know, one answer, you get an answer that comes from three different kind of pockets of data using technology called RAG, um, and then you also can see attributions, so you can see the exact sources of where that information is coming from. Next slide. Um, these are some examples of some of the, what we call the governance surface area. So as I mentioned, it's governed by this concept called a DAO, and so what you can actually do is you can start to make decisions, we refer to on-chain, but this means that the decisions can be automated um, and verified um, using cryptographic technologies. So when I say human and machine attestations, that just means you can see when something happens, there's a notarization that that's exactly what happened. You can't go in, you can't edit or delete it, and so then you get to have the full visibility of how something was trained, key in transparency. Coordinating policies and rules, because you have things like smart contracts, you can begin to program. You can't release something until a certain parameter is hit, or you can't accept a certain type of data unless it meets certain standards. Um, collective ownership and custody, um, 
that's the concept of the models collectively on, therefore it can't be released. Currently it is released to open source and it will remain open source um, on Hugging Face, but the idea there is that um, any of the benefits um, that are received from um, licensing um, or the, the revenue generated from releasing the model um, in like an enterprise setting would be returned back to the organization. Um, the ECI coordinating the human talent, um, centralization of compute is a really big issue. Um, and AI, it takes a lot of machine power to actually train an AI, but there's been great innovations in what we call decentralized compute. And so you can actually use um, systems that are spread out all across the world to run, train and run a model without having to rely on centralized entities, but that requires a technical hook. Um, and talent resources, you want to encourage people from all across the world to contribute. Um, aggregating the assessment evaluations I spoke about previously, and then managing and reinvesting in the treasury, that's kind of a typical DAO surface area. Um, go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so we see all of these technologies linking together to create a new future for AI, which one that can be regenerative. So imagine you get together with a group of people, you decide, hey, this is the data set that we want to contribute. You create that data set. You maybe can you know, work with AI engineers to use an open source model or develop your own. And then you're in control of how that model is released, what resources go into it, you know, what you can benefit from it. And then ideally, if you decide that you want to monetize it, that can then come back to you. And so we're trying to change the way AI is, is um, being developed right now. There's three questions that um, you know we like to always posit um, because we do think this is a collaborative effort. Um, so I'll close with this. So how can underrepresented voices influence AI? Um, right now we are working with a few different groups to um, actually create and generate their own unique custom data sets. That's one approach. Um, how can contributors be paid fairly in attribution? Um, and then how can AI infrastructure be decentralized and secure? So with that, I will hop on the stage. Thank you. Rebecca and Aurelia, this is fantastic. Um, last up we have Josh Tan, who is the co-founder of Medigov. He's the founder and researcher at that organization, which is a laboratory for digital governance. Uh, he's a computer scientist at Oxford, where he explores the intersection between artificial and collective intelligence. Let's welcome Josh. safer 
than both. So public AI might take the form of a public option for AI, akin to healthcare.gov, uh, or a national agency like the BBC. It could be a wide-ranging policy scheme like rural electrification in the early 1900s, or a decentralized network of publicly funded services, much like a library system. And it's happening already in the US. Swiss AI in Switzerland, GPT SW3 in Sweden, Falcon and Climate GPT in the UAE, local Hindu language models in India, and many, many others. And in even these cases are just the tip of the iceberg of national industrial policy for AI, including huge amounts of capital, often for non-public, slightly secretive, defense applications being deployed by governments. There are many arguments for public Politically, public AI ensures that AI systems are built, governed, and operated in accordance with our shared values and for the public's benefit. Ethically, public AI reflects the shared and public nature of the digital commons and the cultural data upon which AI foundation models are built. Economically, public AI guarantees healthy competition in the AI sector and mitigates many of the harms of tech monopolies. For right now, public AI is largely a provocation within civil society, academia, and elite policy circles. It's New York Times editorials, not an app on your phone. There's a gap between today's wonky rhetoric and the actual use cases and the political capital that will deliver public AI to the public. And that's why we're building a movement for public AI. There's already an incredible set of initiatives across this movement, from hundreds of thousands of dedicated GPU hours at large supercomputing super cloud centers around the world, a new public AI research lab at one of the largest data archives in the world, pilots of public AI in states and federal libraries, that's still a budding initiative, and networking building across all the many national labs that are building public AI today. And exactly two months from now, We'll be launching the U.S. portion of this movement across the street from here at the Library of Congress. But we need to do more to change the actual incentives of AI. We need your help. Right now, the political economy of AI is often thought of as the political economy of compute. For example, initiatives like the National AI Research Resource, Cal Compute, Empire AI in New York, Swiss AI, British Cloud, and so on. Don't get me wrong, public compute investment is great. But you can also think of these initiatives a little bit more cynically as effectively mandated free trials of AWS. Mm -hmm. and this is important. This is really important. Because wonky questions about political economy come down to really plain questions like who has the power? And who will make the money? My point. Public compute on its own is not going to change who has power and who will make money in AI. And yet it's where billions of dollars of public investment in AR are going right now. Instead, what if we, we could make sure that public compute was used to generate sustainable public benefit? What if those billions of dollars of investments that have already committed could lead to more sustainable public benefit? In my remaining time, I just want to share small little piece of science fiction that was uh, from one of my friends, Brandon Jackson. So in 2025, imagine, the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy make a surprise announcement. They're launching a new AI system containing the sum of scientific knowledge, and they're making it available to all American citizens for free. In the next two years, a new wave of small labs and independent inventors use this tool to make tens of thousands of new discoveries in new companies. A high school student in Kansas invents a new nanomaterial manufacturing technique for a school science fair, and her project comes out of nowhere to become the next Silicon Valley darling. A 50-year-old scientist in New York, who is aged out of the tenure track, uses public AI to complete this biology research he could never find funding for, changing to the trajectory of not only his career, but of his entire field. In small trip, Americans everywhere start to find their own ways 
from the margins to the center of science and society. Triples that become rivers, rivers that become this great torrent of human activity. And building on this momentum, Congress passes a new Create AI Act that first mandates 50% of all public compute in the US contribute to some form of public or public interest AI, and two, decentralizes the center making, decision making over compute to all 50 states in a range of federal agencies, empowering even more experiments. State politicians begin leveraging federal AI funding to conduct some of these bold AI experiments. The governor of Pennsylvania leads the way by committing to free AI access to all of Pennsylvania's citizens and businesses. A bold young politician in Texas passes a law to commit millions of dollars in public AI to revamp the state's workforce development programs. The Library of Congress uh, steps in in partnership with public libraries and archives around the country to begin curating the world's best AI data sets. License fees from this data then fund new NIH and NSF efforts to develop specialized AI for medicine, reinforcing the economic flywheel of public AI. By 2035, strong public investment in AI has created a flourishing AI ecosystem that exemplifies the best of America, a truly free market accessible not only in theory but in practice, driven by a spirit of enterprise and working to the good of all. For that, at least, is the fiction. around, which was also mentioned earlier. And so DAOs, I think, 
No, I don't think it should be down forward. I think it should be an underlying um, system for how people operate. But there are there are many different tools that you can use today that operate as DAOs under the hood. Our technology operates as a DAO under the hood, but we don't we don't speak of that. So. That's not that's a very wise thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing with so many of these technologies. It, when you leave with it, you talk about it. Even you know, I know I said cryptography a lot. My talk, I know many people are not cryptographers. It begins to kind of muddy the impact and the value of this. And I think the benefit of a DAO is that the decisions are binding. So if you you're a member and you hold tokens that allow you to vote, you can you can see where that vote goes. You can understand the weight of your decision, and you can the decision that ultimately has to happen is dependent upon the activity of all of the members. No one can go in. And, change that, right? And so I think that's what's powerful, is that you can then begin to have, what I said, binding uh, policies and, and decisions, and so then you can begin to move without um, the overhang of the kind of like offline coordination that I think can plague a lot of organizations in their decision making. What's a down <laughs> uh, Why do we need them? That's such a 2022 question. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know, but I do have this thing not a less fluffy question. Um, something I think about all the time is how do we build, uh, I feel like I don't want to talk about this, how do we build ecosystems? How do we generate growth? Um, and you know, I have this question when it comes to climate GDP and all the sort of climate work that's happening. You know, what are the economic incentives to participate in these ecosystems? Are there companies or Different kinds of work being built on top of this data, on top of this technology. Here you were talking about you know, splitting value um, and equity between the but I think this is really a broader question for you know, the, the larger climate ecosystem. And you know, it's just a question I think about all the time when I think about the public health ecosystem and how do I attract actually companies as well, like private enterprise, into this game. And whether curious whether how you guys are thinking about it. Yeah, I can I can start because I think my answer is maybe sh a little bit shorter. But um, one of the things we think about a lot with the Open Climate Campaign is um, with researchers, the incentives is sort of already built in. They work at a university, and publishing their research is part of what they're already paid to do. So this leap in terms of making their research available openly is, is easier for them to make. And so then the question becomes, if they're making their research openly available, and, and they're doing that part in terms of their contribution to the ecosystem, if you will, are others going to come in and then kind of commercialize that or benefit from that financially? And so um, part of what we think about a lot at Creative Commons is, is if we need to almost um, use the Creative Commons licenses or preference marks, if you will, to kind of say, you can use my research in this way, but not this way, for example. But it troubles me a little bit because uh, it works really easily for researchers, but not quite as well, for example, with, with artists, with musicians, with, with uh, you know, any kind of artist that, that their income is coming directly from their work, and so the, in the incentives are quite different. So thinking about those models in different ways. But I would really like to see sort of us working with industry in a way that ultimately contributes back to the commons. So our work is to make more public good into the commons, and then if we're collaborating with industry, they're putting that back into the commons. Actually, I just want to call out right now. Creative Commons is amazing work. I have this here, um, uh, including Rajev Spazinas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, her understanding. If you haven't talked with Bridget, you absolutely must. She's incredible at doing. I think a lot of Creative Commons is kind of cultural kind of data work. Uh, I, talking about economic incentives, um, we also think about this at, at Bandla because certainly there are lots of uh, gen AI music companies that um, are using copyrighted material in order to train their algorithms, and so uh, we think a lot, what, what is the economic incentive for us to avoid this? Why would we go out of our way to put in all of these extra steps to make sure that we're being as white hat as possible when we're designing these systems? 
uh, what's the economic incentive for us to create tools, as I mentioned earlier, that are an inch wide and a mile deep? Um, and I think for, for us it's twofold. One, the economic incentives that we're actually providing a service for creators. Uh, I think there's a distinct difference between platforms that allow you to push button and get audio on the other end, uh, that perhaps is a novelty, we'll see what the sticking power is of that in about five years or so, but the, the desire to create music is something that will be there forever. And so there's, there's economic incentive for us um, to thoughtfully design tools that serve specific purposes. Um, and then uh, economic incentive from an artist point of view is, is certainly how do, I, how do I find tools that service my creative goals um, while also protecting the IP of my peers and other artists. That, that's sort of the twofold approach, and then um, I guess I would say thirdly, we don't we don't know where regulation is going um, around things like image like this, right? Right, publicity, uh, and whether we'll have to license uh, copyrighted data and where to train sets in the future. Um, and so, you know, from a company point of view, there is certainly some future proofing as well when you think about um, how we're designing tools. Thank you. So quickly. I think for climate GPT specifically, um, the royalties that come from licensing, but from enterprises who would like to have um, custom data, like they have their own internal data that um, might be on ESG, for example, and they want to be able to put, program that and plug that into climate GPTs and be able to get their own custom insights that are you know, climate specific. I, I would say that is like just like the very simple, direct um, economic incentive. And then, Hopefully, this concept of, of regenerative systems that these companies are desiring to have more, um, you know, sustainable um, processes and practices, they see their licensing as a way of actually reinvesting back into further research because, again, a percentage of the royalties from their, their license goes back into training, not only for the compute, but also the other types of resources that it takes to train, train the model. Um, a question for you that we were talking about a little bit in the, the green room was, I asked you if you had worked with the government before, because as you were talking about public AI, I'm like, this is quite a feat to jump into to working um, directly in this space, and so I don't know if you wanted to share. Yeah, I'd love to ask you guys, your organizing some experience in the government as well. Um, I actually have to say, uh, I've never interacted with the government before. Uh, in fact, uh, the nonprofit that um, I'm part of was, maybe was, co was founded Precisely, in 2016, out of despair of government. Um, there's, a, there's a headline somewhere, so it's, I'm just quoting something else, but it's like, what is it? Quote, Lawrence Lessig says, Governance in the real world is spot. <laughs> okay, yes. this one now, yes. um, And this is like kind of where we came from. If we want to innovate and revitalize governance and government, Sometimes we weren't going to go by the way of fixing, you know, this or that institution. Even though, of course, it's important. Right? It's so important to do that. But we need to make bigger bets on how to fix governance in our societies. And if you want to make those big bets, you need to deploy research. You need to ask sort of more radical questions and make some big plays. It was hard to make those plays in, let's say, civic tech. I was talking earlier with Anna about this, like, this uh, thing by Civic Hall called Civic Tech Network. I know how many of you have seen it before, but uh, yes, it's fabulous. Um, and it really made me really depressed when I first saw it, uh, which maybe is just like, okay, every startup has 95% chance of failure. Civic Tech Starts has 99% chance of failure. Um, and we want to ask, okay, you know, if it's really hard to run experiments in government, where else can we start running those experiments? And it turns out it's much, much easier to run those experiments in places like Web3, in online communities, in open source, in games, actually, like big MMOs. So we actually like very much started out with the idea that we were never going to interact with governments ever. Um, and we like we were talking about like, the Labour Party a long time ago and said, no, it's not part of our strategy. And somehow we're here. I don't know quite how that happened. But I think we, we take the, the approach of doing things in parallel, that we believe that commercial partnerships are just as um, equally important as um, talking with 
um, with governments, and they need, they need to happen at the same time. So we try to lead the way by showing what we believe is ethical AI through our commercial partnerships, and then at the same time, we're also having really wonderful conversations and educating um, folks in the Senate and Congress, uh, answering their questions, showing them the tech, and um, hopefully advancing some of those um, those conversations down the line. I was lucky enough actually a few months ago to testify for HB 4875 in Illinois, uh, which is essentially the Elvis Act right, for my state. Uh, so it's, a, it's an amendment to our state's right of publicity and that's going to get signed into law in a couple of months. Um, so I think it, it, we, we must interact with folks like yourself in the room and hopefully through the partnerships that we engage in, we can provide some North Stars for what ethical and responsible development can look like in technology and AI. For us, in terms of working with government, so at the Open Climate Campaign, we worked with about 15 national governments globally in terms of developing open access policies to make sure that their research, predominantly no climate research, is available as open access. And you know the, the thing about policy development is the change is really, really slow. So what we have found is um, you know, complementing that policy change by sort of having this, this thematic area to rally behind. And that's where the climate crisis kind of focus really comes in for us to say, you know, we believe that we have to work and develop this policy in a way that works through, you know, all of the hoops that you need to jump through a national government, but the climate crisis just can't wait. So what else can we do? How can we work with you? How can we work with your researchers to um, start moving along this path while policy is happening? And we found that to be extremely effective. Um, you know, I think to, to your point, like running in parallel, uh, the national governments we work with have been really excited in us trying different experiments while they're trying to move policy through. So I think really coming together and saying we need to solve this issue collectively, like these like huge challenges that affect all of us, is a way to kind of move, kind of really move the needle and make that change. opt-in and opt-out and how you really believe you know in having folks opt-in do you see the value in having different nuances in sort of the opt-in opt-out conversation like i would like to opt in but for only these types of actions yeah i i don't think opt-in opt-out sounds very black and white but to your point opt-in opt-out could be i would like to opt into this portion of things but not uh, this portion of things. But I think that we've seen really wonderful outcomes when um, when there are systems built with opt-in in mind. There's there's a, a software that, or a service that I'm thinking of very specifically called VoiceSwap AI. Um, it is a total transfer <coughs> service. They partner with about 15 different artists. So you can go to this website and pay for uh, tokens. Every time you use the token, you can do a total transfer um, you can have your voice or any submitted recording that sound like one of these other artists. And every time you use a token, that artist gets a payment, uh, which is great because it's created an additional revenue stream, a passive revenue stream of that for artists, which we like. That's very yummy. Um, uh, and unfortunately, one of those 15 artists, um, Chuck Roberts, who is an incredibly famous vocalist and very meaningful in my community of house music in Chicago just passed away a few days ago. His voice will continue to live on and his family will continue to receive payments through the service, which I think is just, I'm getting choked up thinking about it, it's incredible. But it really shows the power of how this technology can touch people's lives and how we really need to respect the human being that is on the opportunity side of this the soul of the creativity, the voice, the name, the image, the likeness, all of this is, the, it makes us who we are as artists and we shouldn't have control over what we allow and what we don't allow. Oh my gosh, that's, I mean, it's a good, it's a good closing part. <laughs>